Thank you, Gene. I've heard you on the organ for, but not on the piano. Thank you very much for that. Well, so here we are. At the end, not just of a year, but at the end of an entire decade. On Tuesday night at 12 midnight, depending on time zones, the world will roll into the year 2020. A nice round number. Wow, seems like a big one. And even now as we sit here, thousands of people are making the trek to Times Square in New York City. Anyone know when that tradition began? 1907. Okay. By Tuesday evening, uh, oh, somewhere around a million people will be crammed into just a couple of city blocks in New York City to celebrate the coming of a new year. Now, this looks like fun, doesn't it? <laughs> Has anybody been there for Times Square New, new Year's Eve? Is it fun? I'll, I'll take your word for it, I guess. Um, a million people standing for hours just to see that famous ball drop beginning at 11.59. Uh, in addition to the ball, by the way, at the stroke of midnight, 30 million pieces of confetti will drop all over those million people. Fun, right? Well, here's the not-so-fun part. To enjoy that event in person, uh, you, to get a spot that allows you to actually see the ball as it's dropping, you have to arrive in Times Square early, like 9 to 10 hours early. And guess how many public restrooms are in Times Square? Like, how many porta johns would you bring in for a million people? I was thinking, would you bring in a thousand? Right, that's one for every thousand people. That's a long line still. Would you bring in a hundred? That's one for every 10,000 people. Nope. Zero. Did you know that? None. There are no public restrooms available in Times Square. They do sell adult diapers, though. $20 for a set of 17. You can buy those. That might get you through the, the evening. There's also no food vendors unless you want to buy a table at Applebee's for $350. Then you can actually have something to eat. It's estimated now that 100 million of us will watch on TV as the ball drops. How many of you plan on watching at least part of that? <laughs> right? Did you also know that they estimate that 22% of Americans will be asleep before the ball drops? I've calculated that I have a 90% chance of being on one of those 22%. I'll be asleep. Now here's a question. Why do we celebrate New Year's Eve at all as a culture? I read some anthropologists a couple years ago who said that uh, no matter what calendar human civilizations have followed, they think people have celebrated the New Year for roughly 4,000 years now. It's just kind of a human thing to do. Uh, an article from Psychology Today uh, tried to guess at why. Why do human beings have this need to celebrate the coming of the new year? And they, the guy was guessing two main reasons throughout history. First, survival. We celebrate because we're still here. I guess that's, I guess that's some, something to be said for that, right? We got that going for us. We're still here. But secondly, hope. Hope for good fortune in the year to come. And that makes some sense to me, kind of, because... Uh, there are some very hopeful things happening in the world today that we probably should talk about more. For example, we know that extreme poverty in the world is in decline. We know that um, diseases like uh, malaria and polio are largely under control. That's, those are good things. We know that we've made progress in the global drinking water crisis. That's a good thing. We know that the world is becoming safer and more accessible for those with disabilities. That's a good thing. And we've been involved as a church in some of those things. But on the other hand, there's plenty of evidence that tells us that things are really not getting better. Did you see the story that came out a couple of weeks ago? This just cracked me up. In Philadelphia, in a movie theater, a fight broke out in the theater during the showing of the Mr. Rogers movie. The more you think about that, the more depressing it gets. And yet, human beings seem hardwired. We're hardwired for hope. Second question I want to ask is, uh, not just why do we celebrate, but how, how does our faith as Christians, as followers of Jesus, shape how we think about a new year? This week and next, we're doing a two-part little mini-series on one passage from the New Testament. It comes from Paul's writings to the Corinthians. Chapter 5, verse 17. Listen as I read. Paul writes, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away, and behold, the new has come. 
All this is from God, who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them, and entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ. God making his appeal through us. We implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. For our sake, he made him to be sin who knew no sin so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Now we're going to take this text in two parts. First, we are made new in Christ, and then next weekend we are made ambassadors for Christ. First, we are made new. We are made new. A few weeks ago, um, I think it was just before Thanksgiving, my wife and I took two of our uh, adult sons and went to a movie locally. Um, I don't remember which movie we saw, but I went to the window, asked for four tickets uh, to the movie. And just as I was getting my credit card out to put it in the little machine, my wife pipes up from behind me and says, oh, check and see if they have a senior discount. <laughs> and and I, I had a couple thoughts right at that moment. One was, my card's already in the machine, plus there's no way she's going to believe I qualify. What? You laugh too quickly there. I'm going to have to get out my driver's license, show her that I'm 63, actually, you know. And in, and in that split second, when I was thinking all those things, this young woman who was giving me the ticket didn't look at me. She looked at my wife, and she kind of smiled and winked and went, I got it. She had already given me the senior <laughs> discount. <laughs> now, some people in my family thought that was really funny. Just another reminder that... I'm getting older, and by the way, uh, so are you. <laughs> and yet, in verse 17 here, Paul says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. And Paul now, just, just in this passage, describes being made new in three ways. First, he says, we are in Christ. What does he mean by that little phrase? He uses it all the time in the New Testament, in Christ. He explains further in Galatians chapter 3. He says, In Christ Jesus you are all sons of God through faith. For as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free. There is no male and female. For you are all one in Christ Jesus. And then he, in Colossians chapter 3 he says it this way. For you have died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. Now what does he mean? Uh, a few weeks ago, my wife, Lorreen, some of you actually know this, you follow on Facebook, she made a two-week trip to Southeast Asia, to uh, Malaysia, where she was born, Singapore, Kuala Lumpur, where she grew up, spent some of her growing up years. Her dad traveled with her, who's 90 years old. One of our sons met her over there. Just a great trip. But she didn't get there on her own. That's kind of a long swim. She flew across the Pacific Ocean in a jet airplane, right? We understand that. So you could sense, say, she was in plane. That is, the plane did for her what she could not do on her own. And in Christ means that by faith in the death and resurrection of Jesus, by faith in the power of his blood to cover our sins, by faith we are found in Christ. No longer separated from God, but in him. We are found, uh, we are placed into his righteousness by faith. No longer covered by our sins, but covered by his righteousness. In, by faith, we are baptized into his death and resurrection, Paul says. It means our lives are now hidden by faith in Christ. Therefore, he says, the old has passed away. Because we are in Christ, by faith, the old has passed away. A couple of years ago, um, in, in the middle of the build-up to Christmas time, uh, one of my sons came home from work one day, and he was wearing one of my old sweaters out of my closet. And I thought to myself, cool, it's kind of cool when one of your kids thinks your clothes are, you know, cool enough to wear to work. And I said, hey, nice sweater. He said, yeah, it was ugly sweater day at, at school today. <laughs> you know, the hits, the hits just keep on coming. Now, part of me was thinking, hey, hey. If I wait long enough, that sweater will be back in style, like some of my other clothes. But part of me was also thinking, maybe, maybe it's time to get rid of the old sweater. Paul writes in Ephesians chapter 4, 
to put off your old self, which belongs to your former manner of life and is corrupt through deceitful desires, and to be renewed in the spirit of your minds, and to put on the new self, created after the likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness. Paul is saying here that because we are, we are in Christ through faith, what he calls our old selves, including our old desires, our old ways of thinking, our old ways of living and behaving, all are to be put away, to be thrown out because, he says, the new has come. He says, the old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. How many of you um, gave or received new clothes, clothing for Christmas? Anyone? At our house, our boys are older now, so it's not toys anymore. It's, it's mostly clothes. I got a new, cool new pair of socks. Um, <laughs> but giving clothes for Christmas is a bit of a risky venture sometimes. Some of you guys understand what I'm talking about. Uh, you can pick something your loved one doesn't really like that much. And you can sort of tell by, you know, facial expression, body language. Oh, oh nice. You know, like when, when they open it. Or you can pick something that's the wrong size. And if you pick something that's the wrong size, you, 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 get, you give an unintentional, unintended message. You think I'm a large? You know, something like that. <laughs> or you can do what I did a couple years ago. I went shopping for my wife at Christmas time. Went to one of her favorite stores. Just walked around to see what looks good. I saw this, this really great looking outfit. I could just see her in it. So I bought the whole thing, wrapped it up in a couple boxes, put it under the tree, and all proud of myself. Christmas morning comes, she opens it, and she, she seemed, you know, pleased. You know, and uh, after all the Christmas stuff, she said to me, hey, I'm, come here, I'm going to show you something. Took me up to our bedroom, and we walked in our closet, and she showed me the exact same outfit. That I got it for her the very previous Christmas. <laughs> the exact thing two years in a row. I did that. The point of giving clothes is to give something new, she, she pointed out to me. Uh, Paul says the old is gone, the new has come. New what? What does Christ give us that's new? Now for some of you this will be review, but that's okay. But this is, this is critically important that we understand what Jesus gives us. First, he gives us new heart. By faith in Christ, we have a new heart. The world's very first heart transplant surgery, anybody know what year that was? Do you remember? 1967 in South Africa. And that patient only lived 18 days with that new heart. Yet today, some 2,300 heart surgeries are performed in America alone. The success rate, that is survival past one year, is 88%. And the average cost of a heart transplant is $1.4 million. Now, spiritual heart transplants have been around a lot longer than 1967. Way back in the prophet Ezekiel, God said, I will give you a new heart. He said, I will remove your heart of stone, give you a heart of flesh. And Paul tells us how he does this in Colossians chapter 2. He says, when you were dead in your sins and the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made you alive with Christ. He forgave us all our sins, having canceled the charge of our legal indebtedness, which stood against us and condemned us. He's taken it away, nailing it to the cross. So he says, we have a new heart because you were once dead, but God made you alive. Now, what's the technology? How did he do the surgery? He forgave us all our sins. I put that word all in red because I wanted you to see it here. I want to focus on that little word, all, because I think many of us, sort of rewrite this text in our minds unintentionally. We read it, and we see he forgave all our sins, but we, what we really think is he forgave most of my sins. You know, all of them except, except that one. Except the one I, I still can't forgive myself for, and so we kind of hold on to that one. And we do that because we struggle to understand forgiveness. We struggle to fully understand grace. Jesus didn't go to the cross so that we could be mostly forgiven. He didn't go to the cross so we could be kind of forgiven. He forgave all, Paul says. We are completely forgiven, and in this way we have brand new hearts. And there are two results to this. We no longer have shame and fear. We're set free from shame and fear, and we can afford to, we have the resources to forgive 
others. That's why Paul says in Ephesians 4, be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other just as in Christ God forgave you. I got an email from a young woman I know through Chapel Street who is wrestling with the issue of forgiveness. She's dealing with some some horrific things that happened to her in her young life. Here's what she wrote to me just a few weeks ago. I know that forgiveness is something we should do regardless of whether or not the other person is sorry. I know Jesus died for all our sins, even the ones we aren't or weren't sorry for. I also know, in a sense, forgiveness is to liberate us so we are not chained down by anger or resentment. But in practice, I guess I don't quite understand how it works. So I'm in conversation with her. We're going to meet soon, and I'll explain. She's, she's, you're on the right path. You're under, going in the right direction. It works by grace. He forgave all. And in that grace, we have the resources to forgive others. So we receive new hearts. Secondly, faith in Christ gives us new identity. Paul writes, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Now our culture is consumed by the whole idea of identity, by the issue of identity. And our, our, our cultural gospel today is find your identity. Look deep inside yourself, find your true self, and then be who you are. That's what our culture is teaching. The problem is, how do we know what that is? How do we know who we are? Is it what we feel? Is it what our culture tells us we are? Is it how we dress? Is it how we act? Is it how we talk? Is it where we went to school? How do we know what our true self really is? Listen to what the Apostle Paul says in Romans chapter 8 as he speaks to this issue. He says, the spirit you receive, that's the Holy Spirit, does not make you slaves so that you live in fear again. Rather, the spirit you receive brought about your adoption to sonship. And by him we cry, Abba, Father. The spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. Now, if we are children, then we are heirs, heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ, if indeed we share in his sufferings in order that we may also share in his glory. The Bible tells us that when we put our faith in Christ, we are, we are born again. That is, we have brand new hearts, completely forgiven, and more than that, we are adopted as children of God. That is, our identity is now anchored not in what we feel, not in what our culture tells us, not in what we do, but in who loves us and who chose us. So when we rely on culture to tell us who we are, we're slaves. When we rely on our friends to tell us who we are, we're slaves. When we rely on our feelings about ourselves to tell us who we are, we are slaves. But when we allow Jesus, who made us, who chose us, to tell us who we are, Paul says we are sons and daughters, and we have new identity. Thirdly, by faith in Christ, we have new purpose. New purpose. Uh, as Abe was saying earlier today, uh, this whole last month or so, we've uh, been, tr- been talking about raising funds to give a gift outside our walls. And the particular ministry partner we've chosen is Stephen's home in the Ukraine. And that home is a ministry to young men with special needs begun by a woman named Elise West, who uh, attended right here in this sanctuary for years before she went to do this thing. We set a goal of raising $60,000. Um, to, to buy a couple of vans. And uh, I've been trying to find out uh, from uh, Abe and Fred and others what the total number is. We're all dying to know what's the total number we've raised in the whole month of December. And I don't have that number yet, but what I do know is this, this little hint. In just this past week, from Sunday to Tuesday, those, those Christmas Eve services, we hit $60,000 in those three days. The rest of December combined is at least double that And after today, might even be triple that. So next week, we'll give you the final numbers, hopefully. But that home that we can all participate in by giving to exists because about 10 years ago, Elise West simply felt God calling her to do something. To do something to help these young men who had been abandoned, warehoused by their own culture and by their families. She felt called to a new purpose in her life. 
Listen to how Paul explains this purpose in Ephesians 2. He says, For it is by grace you have been saved, through faith, new heart, new identity. And this not from yourselves, it's the gift of God, not by works that no one can boast. For we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which, notice this, God prepared in advance for us to do. That means that before you ever knew about Jesus, before you even considered putting your faith in him, he had something in mind for you. He had a purpose in mind for your life. And that's why we are constantly here at Chapel Street inviting you and challenging you to serve somewhere. Shepherd's Heart, Buddy Break, one of our local ministry partners with Chapel Street Ministries, children's or students or women's, because God says in Christ we have not only a new heart and a new identity, but he's given us a new purpose. And finally, fourthly, we have received by faith new destiny. A new destiny. You know, Christmas was fun, so much fun this year. At church, you know, we had um, 13 services over three days on three campuses. A little over 5,000 people attended those services. Just a wonderful time of celebration together as church family. At home, we had fun. All four of our boys were in and out of our home at different times. We got to see them all. One uh, brought our daughter-in-law with them. Another had a girlfriend. My wife's father was there. We just had a great time of Christmas. But in the middle of all that, that month of celebration, I was asked, actually honored, to do two funerals from Chapel Street, Chapel Street worshipers. And you would think that, well, it seems like kind of a sad and depressing thing to do during the middle of the holiday season. But both people that we lost uh, had long ago put their faith in Christ. Both of them had lived out new heart, new identity, new purpose. And all, both of them knew they had a new destiny waiting. So while there was sadness and grief, there was, and there is, there was also this sense of, this sense of unquenchable hope in those funerals. Listen to how Peter describes that hope. He says, in, Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that can never perish, spoil, or fade. This inheritance is kept in heaven for you. Now this is why the gospel matters. New birth and living hope. If I could summarize it in just two phrases, the gospel matters because it talks about new birth and living hope. I started by saying that human beings throughout history have seemed just hardwired to hope. And at a new year, we see that people put their hope in all kinds of different things. Some hope to lose weight in the next year. Some hope to eat healthier. Some hope to get out of debt. Some hope to exercise more. You know, resolutions year by year don't change much in our culture. They stay about the same where we put our hope. Some hope for world peace or a strong economy or some hope for a cure for cancer, all good things. Some people just hope and hope. What about us? What about the church? What about those of us who call Jesus Lord? Where is our hope? What do we hope in? Well, Paul says we are made new. New heart, new identity, new purpose, new destiny. Peter says we have a living hope. Therefore, we are to live out this hope by being more of who we already are. Now let me say that again. We live out this living hope by being more of what we already have been made, what we already are. Listen to how Paul talks about this in Philippians, one of my favorite passages in all the Bible. He writes, Not that I have already obtained all this, or am already made perfect, but I press on to make it my own, because Christ Jesus had made me his own. Brothers, I do not consider that I have made it my own, but one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind, the old is gone, and straining toward what lies ahead, new heart, new identity, new purpose, new destiny, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Let those of us who are mature think in this way, and if in anything you think otherwise, God will reveal that also to you. Only let us hold true to what we have attained. I love this passage because, first of all, it's honest. The Apostle Paul says himself, I'm not there yet, he says. I'm not there yet, and I'm not there yet either. My guess is you're not there yet quite either. We're on the way. 
It's challenging. He says straining, pressing on. The images of a runner pressing toward the finish line of a race. It's also simple and clear. He says, one thing I do, forgetting what's behind. You know what I think Paul was forgetting? All those things he had built his previous identity on. His education, his family, his position, his power. Nothing compared to his identity being found in Christ. And I think he's forgetting all the past failures and sins of his life, which were many. Because he knows that word all. He forgave all our sin. And I press on, he says. I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. What's he mean by that? I think he means I press on to become what Jesus has already made me to be. I press on to become what he's already made me to be because he knew Jesus had something more for him. And as we stand at the end of 2019 and look ahead, we can't see the future, but I know this, Jesus has more for you. And he's got more for me. He's got more for us. Uh, A few years ago, my younger brother Joe, who's a pastor in Ohio, decided to do uh, an Ironman triathlon race with his son, Jeremy. My brother was turning 50 at the time. His son was in his late 20s. Um, I, he was having some sort of midlife crisis. I don't know. He decided to do this Ironman. And you know, an Ironman race is a, like a 2.4-mile swim in open water. Uh, it's a 112-mile bike. And then you have to run a marathon, 26.2 miles you run after all that. It's an incredibly grueling thing. So he's going to do this with his son. So he spent almost a year training together, getting ready for this thing, this bucket list experience. And then they went, I think it was in Cincinnati. And the night before the event, or maybe Louisville, uh, it doesn't matter. But the night before the event, there was a banquet for everybody participating in this Ironman. And people do this all over the country. There was a couple hundred people there. And this banquet celebrated, you know, the youngest participant, the oldest participant, the one who'd done the most triathlons, the fastest time, all that sort of stuff. And it was kind of an enjoyable thing, but he particularly remembered the, the guy they, they honored as the oldest participant in that year's triathlon. It was a 77-year-old man who had done like 50 of these. And my brother says he remembers thinking to himself, how in the world does a 77-year-old man do an Ironman? It must take him forever, right? That's what he's thinking. So the race day comes, and uh, he and his, he and his uh, son do the swim together because they had trained together. They do the biking together. But when they got to the marathon part where they had to run, his son ran ahead because he was faster than my brother because he had arthritic knees. He had to sort of shuffle, walk, shuffle, walk to finish the 26 miles. It took him six hours to do the marathon part, so he's now 13 hours into this race. It's crazy, right? 13 hours in, he can finally see the finish line. It's like... 150 yards ahead, he can see it. He's almost done. He can barely walk. He's absolutely exhausted. And he just, just wants to get to the end. And he hears a sound behind him. And it's somebody catching up to him, slowly catching up to him. And he can, he can hear the sound of footprints, footsteps coming up behind him. He's exhausted. He just wants to get to the finish line. He turns around and he sees it's that 77-year-old guy. It's the old guy from the night before. He looks at him, they make eye contact, and my brother, something ha- he said, something happened inside me. He said, I looked at that guy and I said, not today, buddy. And he just <laughs> sprinted, and he sprinted to the end, and he beat the guy. Then later, you know, he gave the guy a hug. I said, I, I understand, I understand. <laughs> but I think that's kind of what Paul's talking about here. The old is gone, the new has come. He says, press on. So press on. You bow with me as I close today. Lord, we thank you for your word today. We thank you that no matter what we see happening around us in our world, no matter what we see when we look back over our lives, no matter what might lie ahead that we cannot see, your promise is the same. New heart, new identity, new purpose, and new destiny. So as we head into a new year, a new decade, remind us as your people, individually and collectively as a church, strengthen us to be more of what we already have been made to be. It's in your name that we pray.